Welcome to ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News. The program you're about to see is free to watch, courtesy of YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. But it wasn't free to make. ARVN's got a lot of money invested in video equipment like this sweet camera and that editing system back there. And it takes a lot of time to shoot and edit a program like this. So I'm asking you to make a voluntary payment, contribution, whatever you want to call it. Just stop by our website, arvn.tv, and you'll see a link to make that payment, whatever you think the program is worth to you. I guess you could say that this program is brought to you by you. So thanks for watching and enjoy the show. Let's welcome Dave Collins, 87JT, and George Heron, N2APB, and their talk on CW mode for the new P's digital modem. Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, what we're, we have a little bit of an unusual presentation, or at least a different presentation style for, uh, for you today. Uh, first, the presentation is uh, two back-to-back. -back. Now, we'll have a little bit of a, of, a, of a group exercise in between just to get the blood flowing and, and uh, whatnot. And also, Dave and I are going to do a bit of a tag team effort, and it's really quite appropriate because Dave and I and the original designer, uh, uh, design team of myself and Milt Cram, W8NUE, have all collaborated for this last release. Dave has provided a major addition to the new PSK modem, which you see right here. Um, if anyone was here uh, four years ago uh, at the DCC, it wasn't here in Baltimore, it was up in Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut you would have seen Milt and myself present this as we kind of introduced this project that we had uh, uh, dreamed up. Um, and uh, does everybody, does anybody, how many people have a new PSK modem? Let's just get a little bit of demographics here. Okay, just a few. Um, so what what the, the new PSK, and new, by the way, stands for uh, Milt, who had the original software effort in getting the project going W8NUE, so hence new PSK. Um, one of our goals, a major goal, actually, was to be creating a, uh, a standalone digital mode operation without the need for a PC. Now, I've, I've told a couple of people around here a little bit of our tagline, and it might even be in, in the paper, but. In 1948, there was a, a famous movie called Treasure of the Sierra Madres. And there was a little known actor in there. His name was Alfonso Bedoya. <laughs> you probably don't know the name, but you probably know his famous words. And who knows it? We don't need no Batches? <laughs> batches? We don't need those stinking batches. Well, that has become, I probably overloaded the video, I'm sorry, Gary. Um, that's become a bit of our tagline because I've been operating PSK and digital modes for a long time. And as with most everybody else along the way, it's been coupled with my computer. You have a little sound card with your computer, you plug it in, and ultimately you need your, the horsepower of your computer and the display in order to do the demodulation and the modulation. Well. If anybody uh, has tried connecting a sound card, such as or a, 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 uh, a soft rock, to your computer, um, or and nowadays, of course, it might be like the uh, Flex 1500 or any uh, the Genesis radio, uh, any RF front end to the computer to make a, an SDR. It's a little bit cumbersome sometimes getting the computer settings just right. In fact, it can be more than cumbersome because you get a lot, there's a lot of things to be concerned with uh, the, the plugs and getting the settings right to recognize the audio going to, that is sent to the soft rock and the audio coming back, you know, into the computer for processing. And I can't tell you how many, uh, how many times, you know, I've been asked, you know, can, can I help in, in that process? Joe and I in the New Jersey QRP club have introduced various soft rocks to the, to the members and group projects, and that's been a very common problem. So we wanted, Dave and Milt and myself, we wanted to be creating a modem, a standalone modem for digital modes 
that doesn't need a computer to operate. It's got all of the embedded uh, processing right in it. All you do is connect this little modem box, and again, it's, uh, it's just the size, we'll be showing it in a moment, in operation, but it's just the size of, of a small transceiver. You connect it to an SSB transceiver, any SSB transceiver, and it sends the tones to the transceiver and um, uh, for, for digital mode, and it receives the tones and decodes them on the, on the LCD built into the unit. No computer is required. So that I don't want to belabor it any more than the, I already have, but that's a critical factor. And to our knowledge, this is pretty much uh, the only uh, in uh, the, the only active type of solution like this. And we've thus far put in this in the capabilities support for PSK, PSK31. We put in the mode capabilities to handle uh, RTTY, so we can do uh, RIDI. And, but all the way along, we've been um, hearing a lot of uh, requests, not for some additional MFSK and um, Oliver or Olivier uh, and, and other types of modes, but also for CW. Now, when you really stop to think about it, CW is one of the oldest digital modes. It's on, off, keen. And uh, if you're into CW on a regular basis, it's relatively straightforward to listen with your ear and send with the paddle. But not everybody has that, uh, uh, the proficiency maybe that they want, so they've always wanted to have a little CW reader and a Morse code keyboard in order to help along. So that's where, where Dave kind of stepped in, built on, on the foundation that was originally provided in the, uh, in the modem. And what we'll be talking about in the first section is the transmit. So the transmit chain. It, uh, we'll go through it in, in kind of a high level. Um, there are some pretty unique characteristics in the design that we wanted to share with you. And it's all built in the DSP, uh, the DISPIC, the DSPIC uh, 33F from microchip. Um, that's at the heart of the modem. And it's, it's really quite a powerful engine. And we've utilized a special characteristic of, of uh, of uh, filtering in there that we're going to talk about. And it really ties well into DCC, which makes our presentation today even more kind of relevant and exciting. Session two is going to be talking about the receive channel. So we thought to break it up in a logical manner, transmit first and, and receive second. The, um, I've, I've covered a lot of this right here as far as wanting to have a standalone uh, modem to take to the field, to be able to operate in bright sunlight without, a, without an, uh, the, the LCD screen of your PC being impeded by the sun, dropping a $700 to $2,000 laptop while you're hiking along the Appalachian Trail. It's uh, uh, not, not too cool. So a lot of benefits in that. And then the CW readers these days, I don't know if you've ever tried them. You know, these are the little boxes. Uh, is anybody here from MFJ, by any chance? <laughs> I, I love my little MFJ reader, but it, it offered some problems in, in its reliability of decoding the characters properly. And it got a lot right, but it got a lot wrong, too. So one of our goals was to make a, just a top-notch CW reader. In other words, it takes the tones coming from your transceiver, and it puts it uh, on the LCD. It decodes it and puts it on the LCD. The basic construction, and then I'm going to turn this over to Dave in just a real short few minutes, a uh, few seconds, is right here. It's shown here. Any old SSB transceiver, and by the way, you can see this in operation in the demo room. We've got the SDR Cube transceiver that I happened to be pres uh, present last year at the DCC. So it's kind of like in operation and, and working quite nicely as, a, as an SSB transceiver and a CW transceiver. So it uh, sends the speaker, audio goes over to the modem, the modem decodes it, displays it on the LCD, and in transmit, a standard keyboard, a standard PS2 keyboard, the round style connector, plugs into the, into the modem and it transmits its tones back to the SSB transceiver over the mic cable or the audio input. That's all it is. There's no computer. There's nothing much beyond that. So once you tune, you can see the digital mode in operation right on the screen. Here with CW, all you do is tune in the CW. 
and the CW Morse code translated comes to the LCD. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, the operation of the reader portion. And the, for the transmit, a standard what we call Morse keyboard, it's, uh, it's been around for quite a bit of time, of course. It was used earlier on in the RTTY days. So when you're working ready, you type it on the keyboard and it, gets, it modulates the tones that, go to your, that goes to your transceiver. And the same kind of thing here. So the construction, the construction of it at a high level is simple. Did you want to uh, overview the architecture uh, from the, the filter and the Morse to ASCII and, and so on? So Dave's going to uh, take it from here and uh, uh, we'll probably do a bit of a tag team so you'll hear me shouting off to the side. <laughs> you can be my heckler. Or, or in, in, a, in an appropriate time, we'll show you it in operation, the actual Morse to ASCII conversion happening on, in, uh, live in real time, and then uh, and vice versa in transmitting. Uh, this is a more functional block diagram of the modem. Uh, you can see there's a programmable gain am amplifier, the audio coming in. Uh, this is the uh, DISPIC chip, the parts that we use, or the parts that are implemented in it. Uh, we use one of their standard A to D uh, converter inputs in the thing. It's sampled at 8,000 samples a second. Uh, for uh, receiving, we use a Gertzel filter to separate the tones. I'll talk about that a lot more. But that provides the on-off keying that goes into the thing that uh, demodulates it, essentially, and then displays it on the graphics screen. Uh, for transmitting, you have the PS2 keyboard, like George mentioned. And then we hit, go just the opposite of that one, from the on-off keying to ASCII, display it. We uh, encode it from uh, ASCII to uh, CW, or to Morse, if you would. There's an external digital to audio converter. And then I made up this symbol because I didn't know what else to do with it. It's, kind of a, it's a filter and a, uh, uh, an attenuator, so you can control the level, the audio level going to the printer, or to the, uh, the, the, the transceiver. Um, that's essentially that, the next one. Perhaps a, uh, a reinforcement is that there's no hardware added to the existing uh, project that we had some four years ago. This is all on software. So yep. it's a matter of using the disk pick to be doing some additional decoding and then displaying to the existing display yep. and taking input from the existing keyboard. Right. And there's, there's the whole part number for the processor. If you have. It's a 40 MIPS processor with a one cycle multiplication and add function in it. Um, these are just some of the tasks we had uh, set out. We wanted to do, uh, in the keyboard to Morse conversion, we want very simple speed control, very easy to use. Uh, we want to send perfect, <laughs> perfect Morse code, um, primarily because we might be receiving it on the other end. <laughs> and then the, uh, the tone generation is done using the existing PSK uh, modulator. The, uh, the original, PSK31 has a, a CWID function in it, which happened to have been designed into the modem. So that made that part very easy for me because I just tapped into that. And uh, from the ASCII on, uh, essentially was all there. Uh, I did some stuff on displaying it and whatnot, which we'll talk about later. Coming back the other way, uh, George's one had rec recommended this Gertzel filter. Um, so we used that to detect the tone and then in the Morris to ASCII conversion, we, we have to detect the speed and track it. Uh, there's some weighting adjustments in here because it, not everybody has a perfect fist. And uh, that's the tweaking that we can do here. And then there's also some things done in a tuning algorithm. You can do things like vary the bandwidth of the filter and whatnot. Uh, first couple definitions um, and terminology. We use mark to mean key down condition space. Uh, key up condition. Basic unit of time in CW is something I call a T sub CW, or I'll just say TCW. And the duration of a TCW is the duration of a dot. It's also the duration of the, uh, of the spaces between Morse elements. Dots and dashes are also referred to as Morse elements. And a dash then is three TCWs, and so is the space between characters. And that's shown on here is the space between, uh, uh, between words, which has to be at least seven TCWs. So perfect CW will follow all these rules. 
So this is the classic definition of CW as far as like the handbook is concerned. Right. And if one were right. to try to aspire to perfect mm -hmm. code, this is what you would be sending. Right. And TCW uh, relates to words per minute in this way. Uh, first off, uh, most of you probably know this, but they, they had a standard word defined as Paris. Paris has four dashes, 10 dots, and a total of 50 TCWs in it. And this is the formula that you can use to translate between words per minute and TCW. Uh, the 1200 comes from, we're going from milliseconds here to minutes, so that's 60,000 of those, and there's 50 TCWs in, in the standard word. Divide that out and you come out with 1200, and that's where that number comes from. And we use this formula for, if you notice up here, we're, we're receiving Paris over and over at 20 words a minute. That's why we translate that. And then when we're transmitting, the operator dials the words per minute, and we come up with a TCW to use for transmitting. Dave, let's, let's spend just a second on this screen. Since not many people have probably seen the, uh, okay. the new PSK digital modem, I, I thought that it would be pretty interesting. We'll see it in operation, actually. So what you see on the top part of the screen is a mini spectrum display. There's a, in this case here, it's a 2.5 kilohertz width of actual signals. So over at the table where we have the antenna connected up, you can, uh, on 20 meters, we can actually see some good signals in there. We'd actually see a bunch of spectrum showing and much like you might have seen in some of the SDR types of products and so on, you can turn the dial on the either the transceiver connected to the, to the modem, or you can turn the little dial on the modem to move that cursor to the appropriate signal that you want to decode. And then, of course, as it, is, as it locks in and decodes, it starts putting the decoded text onto the screen. Along the top, Dave? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is the, uh, well, here we have the date and time. That's part of the real-time clock option that's in there. Um, this, this comes off, this, there's a separate board in there that has that option on it. It also has the USB interface that you can use to put a flash drive in and do logging and things like that. Uh, and then there's this, now there's, this is kind of a software version behind what's uh, about to be released, or I guess it's even behind what is released. We've also added a battery monitor right in this position here where it, get, it monitors the battery voltage so that you can get alerted if the, your battery's running down. Um, people do use this thing out wherever. <laughs> you know, we got pictures of it on motorcycles and. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I don't know. That's kind of like texting with a cell phone. I want to <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, this shows a pretty clean spectrum because it was one transceiver sitting on top of the other talking to each other. So, with all the RF gains turned down as low as I could get them in order to to not blast one of them out of oblivion. And so that's, normally it isn't as clean. Normally there's a, a lot more in the spectrum out there. Um, okay, here's the transmit channel. We've got actually got two sources for, uh, uh, for, for code, if you would, or for text. And they both produce ASCII. And ASCII is what's, we have the keyboard, we talked about that, we do this and code processing. Most of you are probably familiar with how you have to manage a PS2 keyboard, and it's not pretty. I won't get into that. <laughs> and that, but we also have in the modem. There's a double EEPROM, fairly good size one, in fact. And there's uh, you can have seven macros up to 255 characters each. In there, and then there's hotkeys. Actually, the func first seven function keys on the keyboard will pick the uh, uh, the macros. There's a separate set of macros for CW than for the other digital modes. And the reason I did that is I'm not that familiar with the, the digital modes other than CW. And so when I first got the modem and started monitoring stuff, it appeared that, to me anyway, that the PSK operators were a lot more verbose than CW operators. Seems like everybody had a canned macro someplace that would tell their whole life's history, and then they'd have another one that would tell every piece of equipment they ever owned and whatnot. <laughs> Whereas the typical CW operator was uh, uh, goes something like this, R R F B O M R S T five N N Q T H A Z O P D A V E T U F B Q S O seventy three. Yeah, and then, <laughs> right. So so I figured put a separate set in there, and the operator could could wear either hat. Uh, they're both loaded and uh, 
called up the same way. It just depends on whether the modem's in CW mode or one of the other digital modes. Uh, there's also a couple other hotkeys where you can inject your call sign into the text stream or their call sign and a couple other things also. The ASCII coming out here then is displayed on the screen so you can see what you're typing. And there's a limited editing capability at that point as long as you're typing ahead far enough. And um, then it's also queued for transmission where we translate to ASCII to Morris. This goes in essentially on the CWID interface that I mentioned and through the phase modulator and audio off to the transceiver. And then if you have the uh, option card in, uh, you can, as an option, also log everything. Everything's put on the flash drive with a, uh, a date stamp and it tells you this is, your rece starts receiving at such and such a time, starts transmitting at such and such a time. So you, you can follow a timeline through it too. So out of everything up here, Dave, can you point out the new, what is, what is the, the addition, the main addition to this existing architecture? This, of course, is the main thing. And then there were some changes were made in the way, which we'll talk about the way the graphic display is done and handled. Remember, we have to transmit perfect CW. And so that meant we had to do some things a little, little different, I think, than the other digital modes do. And then um, the new macros, of course, but that's just more stuff in there. Not much, <laughs> as it turns out. The transmitting was a lot easier, needless to say. As we mentioned, it's a standard PS2 keyboard. Uh, I use a, a USB keyboard with just little adapters in it. It works fine. Uh, one of the things we did, because um, Morse code is not case sensitive, uh, we force it into uh, uh, case in, into a caps lock mode. You know, it's a cap lock key if you push that. And then, then every alpha character is, is put in as a uh, uppercase letter. And uh, lowercase letters are put in if you put a, uh, if you hold the shift down if you're in this mode. We use the uh, lowercase letters for generating and displaying, actually, pro signs. Things like, you know, BK for, for break. Uh, if the B is lowercase, it'll leave the space out between the two letters. That way we didn't have to put in a bunch of hotkeys for various pro signs people might want to make. You can create your own, do whatever you want up here. In fact, you can make a whole big string of them. <laughs> um, and then there's, I mentioned hotkeys for entering my call and their call. And another thing we did, um, anybody who does much contesting knows that some of the, con number of the contests actually use serial numbers. We have to serialize your, uh, your, your QSOs. And so we put some support in for serialize, serial numbers in here so we keep track of it make it a little easier. Um, the EEPROM, we mentioned that, seven separate uh, uh, macros up to uh, 255 characters each. And then in the macros, you can put tags for turning transmit on or off, for inserting my call, their call, and for inserting the serial number. And then to make it easy uh, to manage the macros, you can dump the macros to a flash drive, take it to your PC, and use virtually any um, a text editor and uh, put whatever you want in there and then download it back into the, uh, into the modem. And that can be done, like you could have a set of macros for this contest, a set of macros for that contest, or, or you know, working DX, or a bunch of three-character three macros for... And this has actually worked operating. out really well, too, from the standpoint of operators using the keyboard. I mean, picture, if you will, you know, you want to, when you're when you're on a paddle, um, or even if you were doing existing or, or common RTTY, you need to say, okay, John, you know, NU3E, this is great talking with you. Um, I'm glad uh, I can hear you fine from Baltimore and, and so on. If we were to put in a macro which contained um, um, a sign, you know, NU3E, this is N2APB, um, RST blank, and we could put the macros in just as you would think a normal macro would be in a, in a paddle, like in a paddle keyer that you might have, um, or in a, in a PC program that you might be using for that purpose too. Um, but putting the TX on, which turns the modem into transmit, uh, putting in a tag for the my call would automatically enter my call such that all I have to do is type the basic, uh, the basic information, hit the macro 
uh, playback, and then boom, it plays it back, you know, giant NU3E, this is George N2APB receiving fine, uh, fine business here. It just makes it a really pleasant experience. And so the work that Dave has done and the, the building on what was originally started with the modem has just been phenomenal to, to make the ease of operation, especially out in the field, on a micro, on a motorcycle or yeah. on a mountaintop in bright <laughs> sunlight to kayak. be able to use this thing. <laughs> That's right, someone's using a kayak. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, during the testing on this, I used this at one contest. Um, I only worked it for a couple hours and whatnot, but I made 85 contacts only pushing two buttons. <laughs> That's all I ever pushed was two buttons. <laughs> and, I wasn't calling CQ, so I didn't even have to record their, you know, fill in their um, their call signs on it. But that worked out kind of neat. I, the reason I only worked a couple hours is because I push a few buttons, say oh, I didn't like that, so I go and change the code again, and then then, come, then go on with the contest. Okay, now the the graphic display on on the modem, the bottom four lines uh, show the text that you're keying. Um, there's line scrolling, so alt text typically goes in on the bottom line. There's a way to backspace into the next line, but uh, typically you'll just be keying on the bottom line. When you hit the end of the line, then it moves up, and the top line disappears, and th those three lines move up, and the cursor moves to the beginning of the line. Um, up above on the screen, we've got a couple controls. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The uh, first one is for... Uh, setting the, the word per minute that you're going to transmit at. And that, if when you turn the tune knob, since we can't tune and transmit, the FCC doesn't like that. So we use the tune knob to, uh, to adjust that speed. So once you're in transmit mode, you can dial whatever transmit speed you want. Um, if you hold the uh, control key down, turning this then will select a different side tone frequency. There's like eight of them, I think, that you can, can choose from there. Uh, the side tone, we use, the, there's, there's a little hole there in the cabinet. <laughs> there's a speaker, a little piezo device that, uh, that we use to make, it, normally it's just giving error indications, error beeps, but I use that to generate the side tone, a range of frequencies. And you can turn that on and off just by pressing the escape key that toggles it on and off. And there's a separate control for receive and transmit, so it's there for both of them. Now, remember I said we wanted to transmit perfect CW. Uh, one of the things we didn't want was the spacing to be dependent in any way on how good or bad a keyer the operator was. So what happens, if you, I think you can see it there, this, this last word, if you notice the overline on it, there's a line over it, and the cursor is sitting right here. If another key is never pressed, that word will not get transmitted. We transmitted whole words only. As soon as the space is, is keyed, then that'll transmit. Now you can key way ahead, you can, you know, depending on what your keying speed is and what the word per minute you have set here. So you can, you can get the whole thing <laughs> with the lines and it's trying to catch up and everything. But the la and that you, determines how far you can backspace into it too, because if you ever start transmitting a word, you don't want to be able to backspace into it and edit it. But you do have a chance to at least catch the last word. <laughs> if you make, usually when you make a keying mistake, you know about it right away. And then, uh, Notice, yeah, right here, the lowercase bt, that's a pro sign. <laughs> that was, uh, so you keyed in the lowercase bt. The second one doesn't have to be lowercase, but it doesn't make much difference if it is. Now you can type faster than you can transmit, of course, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. As we'll talk about tomorrow, yeah. we're, we're having a digital mode, introduction to digital modes uh, as tomorrow's introductory, mm -hmm. one of the introductory sessions. We'll talk a lot about some of these things, but PSK31, um, and then has well. CW as well, of course. It's very conversational. PSK31 is a very conversational uh, type of mode, so many of us can type faster than we actually uh, can think. Can think, and, <laughs> and more importantly, than is being transmitted out the modem. <laughs> is that personal to me? Or no, no. <laughs> so. Um, so there's a mechanism that's, that's in here that Dave just indicated with the over, o overscore? Yeah, well, overline. Overline uh, that says that's the data that's queued up. So you can say, hello, my name is George, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, boom. And then it'll go bum, 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 in order to get out. So it's kind of a useful thing. Something to keep in mind, all of this is in this little box. 
It's all in this box. Many of the features that you might be seeing here, oh yeah, I've seen that. I've, I've seen that. It's on my PC. Um, it's on, it's on uh, you know, the FL Digi, which is a great program. And it's on this and Digi, uh, DigiPan and a lot of other programs. But this is all embedded. And again, it comes back to the point of this is uh, in a little embedded solution that mm -hmm. you can take on the road pretty darn easily. Yeah, it, there's four lines of 20 characters here, but the actual transmit queue, the buffer, is 256 characters. It's used uh, cyclically. Um, so there's stuff, you can have stuff queued that isn't on here <laughs> if you really key fast. <laughs> and you, you'll see nothing happen, but you'll hear it transmitting, and eventually it'll get down to start clearing the line that's in there, or clearing the overline. In the area we're talking, and it's you, you can watch that, and that tells you when it's safe to turn off transmit mode, also, because if you turn it off before you transmit everything, that's that's not a good thing. Okay. Now the uh, translating uh, this this is fairly straightforward. Uh, the way it's encoded is maybe a little different. Uh, the ASCII code for a C is a 43, and this, there's a 16-bit word in a table. It's eight two-bit fields. Dash is a two, one, zero, dot is a one, whatever. And then each one of these is transmitted with uh, one TCW between them. So this first one actually represents four TCWs, three for the dash and one for the uh, space. And then um, the dot would only would represent two TCWs and so on. And this last one down here says just put two more TCWs in there. And with the TCW of follow, uh, space following the uh, last dot, that brings it up to three, then anything with a zero in it ends. In the case of a lowercase letter, the same table would have the same value in here, except these two would be two zeros, which essentially tells the guy not to, not to inject the uh, other two uh, spaces, other two TCWs of space in there. And I mentioned he uses the CWID feature. And again, we're, we're doing uh, 8,000 output samples per second, the same as the input. Standard. So what, uh, just to kind of explain that, that uh, uh, the sequence of ones and zeros, that is uh, essentially a data byte, an 8-bit uh, data Six, byte. 16. Uh, 16 bits. 16 bit that is shifted yeah. out. Um, yeah, well, essentially, yeah, you take the top, the top two bits, then the next two, next two, next two until you get zero and that tells the thing it's done. So it's like a representation of the way that the embedded processor is able to take those bits out and then key according to the coding that was in the table that comprised that, that those ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I think that covers the, the transmit side. I was just curious on the performance in, uh, in noise and QRM. How well does the thing decode? Uh, in QRM. On the receive side. Yeah. On the receive side. Um, we've gotten some very good reports. Uh, as you'll see, you, you can vary the bandwidth of the modem itself independent of the, in fact, it's best to do it in the modem because if you, if you start using filters in the transceiver, then it narrows that spectrum display and it makes it harder to tune <laughs> in here. Whereas you can actually vary, um, we, we can show it on here, the new firmware will actually shows what the bandwidth is on that uh, spectrum display and whatnot. But that's, uh, that's in the, uh, the, the second part of the presentation. Yeah, this is more of a comment than, than a question. I'm glad you added a piezo feedback device, audio feedback device. When I was working on a PS2 key era project, it was very spooky and surreal to send CW without hearing it. Mm -hmm. Just seeing it wasn't good enough. Yeah. And I was very high on my to-do list. I really need to have feedback. Mm -hmm. so good that you did that. <laughs> I felt the same way. It's <laughs> let you know it's working, really. Which While should... the microphone's put it back to the back corner, this is a great point to say um, two things. And it's, it's incredible that you pointed this out, David, is that um, MILT, W8NUE, <coughs> and, and I developed a project some four years ago. It's open source. and um, the hardware is readily available and easily duplicatable by anybody. Um, what we did was uh, we've encountered various people along the way of, you know, we, of course there's a, a Yahoo group list and users are chiming in with questions and what about this, what about that. Dave was one of the people who, who hopped in here and said, hey, 
What about this? Hey, I want to play. So he grabbed the open source, much like anybody might be able to do on many of the projects that we're talking or hearing about today. And uh, with a pretty inexpensive programming pod, you can do this with a PIC Kit 2 or now the PIC Kit 3, is able to program that uh, the, uh, the modem, there's a little header on the inside, it's made for connecting. So anybody could be uh, uh, changing the software to their liking. Dave really hopped in there in a, in a deluxe way and started changing around. I made the mistake of asking, well, first off, you know, I got the modem as a Christmas present from my wife. And I noticed in George's literature, he mentioned this thing, RTCC thing. And they, they said, he said that there was information available on it. And so I thought maybe the web page was out of date and this thing had been developed. So I emailed him and asked him about it. And he said, well, no, we had a little setback on that, but I'd be glad to collaborate with you on it. And he sent me a mountain of information that he had collected and all his thoughts. And, and the, one of the pieces of information, just to complete my thought, was Dave, uh, Dave Byrne, and yeah. W2 and LX? Mm -hmm. LNX. Right. Then Dave presented at this conference uh, two, two years ago his project for a Morse keyboard. Well, actually, the reverse so, of Morse keyboard. CW2. It replaced it with a key. CW2. PS2. To replace the big keyboard of your, for your modem, to use a power. Okay. Yeah. So collaboration, again, is the underscore uh, that, I, that I wanted to point out. Joe. Yes, uh, quick question on the uh, decoding, Morse decoding function. Have you done any comparative testing with, say, the MFJ or any of the other Morse decoders? Some you get a uh, some quantitative the, feel for how well it does? Some of the users have. We've got one user that, I don't know if he's telling the truth or not, but he's saying it's the best one he's ever seen, and he rattles off about 10 of them I'd never heard of that he's... Apparently this guy is into decoders, and he really likes it. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a famous uh, quote. The, the, the uh, person escapes me, but he's one of the famous uh, scientists in the past, said that uh, uh, all the tests in the world are great. Basically, it boils down to all the tests are great, but they don't mean anything unless you attach numbers to them. Mm -hmm. I made this contact with this little pixie transceiver or the transmitter. I contacted... Japan, it's got to be the best thing in the world, right? Because it worked for me, and it worked right now. Comparative tests haven't been done, but uh, anecdotal experience uh, from multiple users has shown that it's good. Joe knows my little tweak button here, and that's why he asked the question, but it's a very valid question to do a bit of a control type of experiment that compares. There's, a, there's another thing, though, I really forgot to mention. The Morse code that we generate here is we shape the waveform I use a, a sync waveform, you know, sine x over x, to, just to round the corners off and, and make it sound better. And when I was, I mentioned I was in that contest, it was an international contest, you know, I was talking to people all over the world. Um, and I think I had more first time responders come back to me than I've ever had before. I assume that means the CW sounded pretty good. <laughs> and they could pick me out, because some of them were, there were quite a few people out there. But there were very, very few out of the 85 contacts I made. I bet there wasn't more than five or six of them where I didn't get an instant comeback the first time it went out there. Of course, some of them I never got back, but that was. <laughs> just All right, any other questions for now? Oh, yep, in the back. Years and years ago, there was a letter in QST from an old timer who deeply resented that anyone would dare to use a machine to send and receive. CW, <laughs> and he could detect this, of course, because the CW was perfect. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions. Have you thought about simulating a human fist that's <laughs> less than perfect CW? And no, no, <laughs> no we haven't. <laughs> Sorry about that. We've had some good reports from some of the users, though, that it does a pretty good job of copying straight key. If we didn't mention it, um, it, it, and I think we will on the receive side, mm -hmm. there's dynamic adjustment to different weightings, dit to da weightings that, uh, that are coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. Dave has done an incredible job in that regard. Um, and I might also say that from a test perspective, we could probably use a sample, Joe, N2CX, of some unusual keying patterns. <laughs> could we not? Would you be willing to participate with us in that? 
Jack, I'll give you the random game. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this fellow also said that he got even with such people by deliberately messing up his fist so that their computer wouldn't be able to read him. Yeah, I use that excuse too. <laughs> And quite frankly, quite frankly, we had been resisting, Milt and I, before Dave came along, we had been resisting uh, putting CW mode into this modem for that very reason. And, and frankly, if you haven't asked this in your mind yourself already, it's just, why don't you just use a key and a CW transmitter in your ears? And, uh, but the, the, it begs the question, of course, that you know some if you really stop and think about it, and your friends, and maybe even some of you in here, you haven't used CW in a long time, you really want to. You really like to, but either your fist has fallen off or in, in performance. <laughs> or, or, you know, your hearing is bad. I can, I can certainly testify to that. And you really like CW. So one of the underlying goals that we had in this project was to provide a way for guys to, for people, to really get back into CW in some fashion and to have it work, not just use a, a, a first of all, I don't know of any combination CW reader and Morse code, uh, uh, Morse keyer all built into one, but to have it all together in an easy portable package that's, uh, that's, that's easy to make yourself, easy to, uh, to implement. And to use the CW, I love CW. That's my only mode of operation, besides the digital stuff. But um, I, I barely know what a PTT is on, a, on that thing called a mic. <laughs> but the point is, is not everybody's like many of us are in here. And getting them back to CW has been a, such a thrill. We've been talking to some people on the, on the group that have been saying that, man, this is so great. You know, I've been wanting to do this. I've been wanting to get back in. Some people have been saying that it's a, even a check to you know what they're hearing. There's a slight delay, as you would think, during the decoding time. Uh, but to hear, uh, to see the, uh, to see the character come up that they thought they heard, is tremendously reassuring to them, and it's helping them kind of get the rust off of their own CW practices. So, you know, we we, we did it. It's been a great trainer. <laughs> Question. I, I tried to look quickly at your paper. Is the code available? Yes, it's all open source. Excellent. You download it. Is it, it, is it in the paper where to, where to get it from? Uh, yeah, but it's real easy, too. It's newpsk.com. Okay. Cool, thank you. Yeah, with the hyphen. Yeah, with the hyphen. Oops. And uh, oh, we're going to do a little bit of an experiment right now, please. Can everybody stand up? <laughs> Now be very now be very careful and use your neighbor if you can if you if you need to lift one leg. Which one? Fire right. It doesn't matter. <laughs> lift a leg. And with the opposite hand with the opposite hand raise it. Okay? All right. Now do the opposite. So drop the leg and go the other way. Turn around and look at the people behind you. Okay, good. We're going to start the second session now. 